Welcome back to Differential Equations. This is part two of our lecture on homogeneous equations. Part one, we saw where the technique comes from and went through example one. Part two, we'll start with some technical definitions and then a lot more examples. All right, so at the beginning in the intro, so for part one, uh, we saw for that first example, the informal idea that all the terms should be the same degree for the uh, equation to be homogeneous uh, in order for that technique to work. So let's make this a little bit more precise. So we're going to try to define what a homogeneous ODE is, but we first have to give a definition for what a homogeneous function is. And you'll see where the uh, degree two part plays into this. All right, now we're gonna assume a little bit of knowledge for multivariable functions. So notice this definition here starts off a function f, but it's not a function of just x, but it's a function of x and y. If you've completed calc three multivariable calculus, you're probably comfortable with functions of several variables. All right, so the definition here, we're gonna say a function is called homogeneous of degree n, and the definition is simple, but it looks complicated. Notice on the left side of that equation, the variables were replaced with t times x and t times y. So the definition here says, if we make a replacement in both variables, tx and ty, the equation or function is homogeneous of degree n if we can pull out a factor of t to the n from every term and rewrite this as t to the n times the function of x and y. So that factor that we pull out, that what defines the degree for this homogeneous function. All right, now the next definition relies on this and we're going to say a first order ODE is called homogeneous if it can be written in this form and it looks like it's been separated, but there's a substantial difference. Even though we have individual differ differentials, dy and dx, notice we now are allowing for the mixing of variables on both sides. So if that equation, ODE, can be written as a function of x and y, times dy equals a function of x and y times dx, where those two functions are homogeneous of the same degree, then we say the ODE is itself homogeneous. Sounds like a mouthful, perhaps very confusing, keeping track of the definitions. Let's refer back to our first example to uh, reference these uh, two definitions. All right, so starting example one, we begin by trying to separate it. All right, what we can identify from here, this is now of the form for a homogeneous ODE, where we can identify the function f of x and y on the dy side as x squared, and the function g of x and y on the dx side, that'd be x squared plus xy plus y squared. So we're just right now identifying what f and g are in that definition of a homogeneous ODE. So let's write that. We're going to identify f of xy as x squared and g of xy as x squared plus xy plus y squared. Now before we reference the technical definition at the top of the screen, so a homogeneous function of degree n. Notice informally, the right-hand sides of both those functions, f and g, they only contain degree two terms. Now, if you recognize that, that's a good hint or clue that your equation or the functions involved are themselves homogeneous. Now, let's just check using the technical definition for a homogeneous function above we're going to replace in both functions x with tx 
and y was ty. All right, so let's do that first for the function f. This one's pretty simple since there's only x squared. We just replace x with tx, and we get in parentheses tx but squared. Apply your basic exponent rules, and there's really nothing to simplify. We have now expressed this after substituting tx and ty in. We have a factor of t squared out front times the original function. So t squared, the original function here is x squared. So this is homogeneous of degree two. That's what that power of t tells you. All right, let's do the same thing for the function g. In order for example one to be homogeneous, we have to verify that the function g on that right hand side is also homogeneous of degree two. Informally, you can see that but let's implement the definition. All right, now since there are both x and y, we have to make a replacement. x gets replaced with tx, and y gets replaced with ty. All right, and if you're careful, notice it simplifies using exponent rules so that every term contains t squared. So we can factor t squared out from everything, and we're left with t squared times the original function g of x and y. All right, don't go through this for any of our actual examples, but this is the definition for a homogeneous function. And if you are moving on into a higher level science and engineering courses, uh, even some mathematics courses, uh, they reference homogeneous functions. All right, so this just verifies that the ODE in example one is homogeneous. In other words, our substitution that we addressed will work and it's solvable. That substitution converts it to one that is separable. And that's what we uh, went through in example one in part one. All right. These are our technical definitions, but the informal idea of every term being of the same degree makes it a little bit quicker to spot. When you're ready, let's take a look at example two. This one's moderate in terms of its difficulty. So I'd like you to pause and give an attempt at this. This one, give yourself maybe five minutes should be very straightforward if you understand the substitution that we make along with the conversion, the substitution for the derivative. When you're ready, check in in about five minutes. Welcome back. If you're ready, let's go through this. So in our ODE, so the original equation, we have to make two replacements. All y's get replaced with u times x. And we also have to convert and replace the derivative dy over dx with an appropriate expression in terms of u. All right, just be careful with some, some of your algebra here. Notice the factors of x cancel out. And due to the u term being left on the right side, that cancels out with the u on the left side. Now, just because that u term canceled out here in example two and in example one, the u term doesn't always cancel. And you'll see that in an upcoming homework assignment, uh, what happens if the u doesn't cancel. Um, it tends to make the, uh, the integrations a little more complicated. Fortunately here, the U terms do cancel out and it seems to be very easy to then properly separate this. We can multiply U over, multiply DX over, and then divide by X. All right, at this point, 
the ODE has been properly separated in terms of U and X for the variables. And we just need to integrate both sides. Left side, we're going to integrate with respect to U. Right side, we're going to integrate with respect to X. All right, and we are practically done. In order to get this back in terms of our original function, which was y as a function of x, we just substitute u as y over x. So we get our implicit solution here for example two. All right, I don't think this one was too bad. Notice there was no, uh, no complicated uh, integrations required. Example three, we'll start to incorporate that where uh, we have to apply our substitution and then the resulting integrals might be a little, uh, a little challenging. When you're ready, let's take a look at example three. All right, I like to also give you an attempt for this one. This one it requires a little more time so pause the lecture, pause the video, and give yourself, I would say, about 10 minutes to solve this. If your integration skills are really good, you might be able to get through this a little bit quicker, but there's also some algebraic difficulties here as well. So give yourself about 10 minutes, pause the video to make an attempt, and we'll check in. All right, welcome back. Hopefully this one went well. There's some moderate algebraic difficulties and then a tricky integral to evaluate. Now, if you weren't sure where to start for homogeneous equations, we always have this as our starting place. We make a substitution for y, y equals u times x, and we make a substitution for the derivative of y. So make sure you use that to start and we're going to convert, plug those in to convert this and continue. So if you are stuck, maybe repause, make those appropriate substitutions. If you feel okay, let's proceed. Okay, we're going to plug both those in to the original differential equation. On the right hand side, that fraction, notice every term in the numerator and denominator contains a factor of x. You might notice that fraction, every term seems to be of degree one. x, 3y, 3x, and y all seem to be degree one terms. So that seems to be what we are looking for with a homogeneous equation. Um, homogeneous means things are the same. All right, on that right-hand side, you can factor out x, and it cancels out, leaving you with 1 plus 3u divided by 3 plus u. All right, so let's put that below. Notice I switched the order just to make the denominator look a little bit better. Instead of 3 plus u, I'm writing that as u plus 3. All right, now you should expect at some point, you're going to try to separate, and there's lots of uh, cross-multiplying, cross-dividing, manipulating fractions. But notice now the u does not cancel. What we can do is subtract u to the right-hand side, and then try to combine using a common denominator. So what we're gonna do is take one plus three u divided by u plus three and then subtract u. We're gonna use as our common denominator u plus three. So take your u term, multiply and divide by u plus three, and it should fall into place and be pretty simple from there. 
All right, so if you combine those fractions on the right-hand side, you should get one minus u squared divided by u plus three. Make sure you're comfortable with that. Very easy for some uh, simple algebraic mistakes to be made there. All right, if needed, pause to you know, really understand that. But let's plug that in and keep going. And now it's starting to look more like it's going to be easily separated. Now, what I want to do is introduce a simplifying kind of technique or kind of way to rewrite this from the beginning that will save you some trouble later on. So what I'm going to do, and we'll come back to this, so make note of this step right here, I'm going to factor a negative out from the numerator. So instead of leaving the numerator as one minus u squared, I'm going to factor out a negative. So I'll write that numerator as negative, and then in parentheses, u squared minus one. Now, the reason that I'm doing that is I'm looking ahead, and you might be able to see where we're going. We're going to basically divide that fraction to the left side to separate this ODE. And we're going to get u squared minus one in the denominator. Now, u squared minus 1, we can factor that. It's a difference of squares. And eventually, because the denominator is going to factor, it leads to a partial fraction decomposition. I'm looking that far ahead to eliminate some potential sign errors that are likely going to occur. They're going to occur, the sign errors, predominantly if you use the unfactored version, 1 minus u squared. So we're gonna proceed by factoring that negative out. Once we complete example three, we'll come back to uh, that common error as a follow-up. What happens if we don't factor the negative out? What could go wrong? Uh, there's a common mistake that students often make, which we'll point out. All right, if you feel comfortable, let's proceed. We've simplified and now we can attempt to separate this ODE. I'm going to keep that negative on the x side. So we'll separate this to u plus 3 divided by u squared minus 1 times du equals negative 1 over x times dx. All right, so so far, most of the work has been algebraic in nature, a you know fair amount of algebra. To complete this, the integrations of both sides the integral on the left side, that comes down to a partial fraction decomposition. That's where most of the recommended 10 minutes for this question probably occur. Some time was for the algebra, most of the time for this integral here, the partial fraction decomposition. Now I'm going to advance to the work for that, just in case you uh, don't feel confident with that or you want to see some of the steps but partial fraction decomposition should be part of your working knowledge coming into this course. So let's do the partial fraction decomposition for the integral on the left side. I have all the work here. Make sure you're comfortable with this. Start by factoring the denominator, u squared minus one. That's a difference of squares. We get two factors, u plus one and u minus one and that separates into two partial fractions. All right, if you do that correctly, you should find A comes out to be negative one and B comes out to be two. If you plug those in, you can integrate both those expressions, those partial fractions, pretty easily. It should be pretty natural. Both those fractions integrate to natural logs. So we get for our integral, this was the left side, negative natural log of u plus one plus two times natural log of u minus one. Uh, you might argue you forgot the plus c. We're going to include the plus c on the x side, the right side. 
All right, so if we go back to the problem, and again, feel free to pause, review if needed, rewind, go back. We had these integrals. The, the integral on the left side required a partial fraction decomposition. The integral on the right side, very straightforward. Okay, so at this point, we're basically done. We always want to back substitute u as y over x, and we get a nice implicit solution here. Okay, so most of the work was probably for the partial fraction decomposition. Hopefully you felt uh, you got through that uh, pretty confidently. If not, definitely follow up with me during virtual office hours. All right, now this one has some built-in follow-ups to it, but again, we're gonna have a separate follow-up on what if we didn't factor that negative out? What sort of a common mistake could be made? If you're up for a challenge, this implicit solution actually simplifies considerably to still an implicit solution, but notice our original implicit solution has three natural logs within it. By using properties of logs and then some algebra, you can simplify that implicit solution to this version here, which looks significantly simpler. So give that a try. That's a, again, a great thing to follow up with me on, but not required for, um, for this question. All right, if you're ready, we've completed example three here. We're gonna give a follow-up on what if we didn't factor out that negative. All right, so this is gonna to refer to some of the work from example three. So you might recall a few minutes ago when I asked you to take note of an important step. We had in the numerator on the right-hand side, one minus u squared. We decided in going through the problem because we were looking ahead to doing a partial fraction decomposition that we wanna factor that negative out to make our life a little bit easier and to avoid a common mistake. Now let's suppose that we didn't factor that negative out and we just left it as in the numerator on the right hand side, one minus u squared. What effect does that have? Now it does separate pretty easily. Notice above, we just basically flip the fraction over and we get on the left side, u plus three divided by, now in this version, one minus u squared. Notice the right-hand side now has no negative because we didn't factor that negative out. Okay, looks very similar. We're still going to factor the denominator and perform a partial fraction decomposition. But now the factorization looks a little bit different. U squared minus one, that's a more familiar form for a uh, difference of squares. But now one minus U squared, that's also a difference of squares. Factorization shouldn't be too bad. But what we get is this troublesome denominator, one minus U. Now let's forget about the partial fraction decomposition. Forget about solving for A and B. That's not the issue. The common mistake that I've been alluding to is students integrating that second partial fraction. The integral of one divided by one minus U. Now it looks very similar to some of the other integrals that gave natural logs. But if you were to integrate this, it does not turn out to be natural log of one minus u. There is a missing negative that appears there. Now, I'd like to introduce a nice little shortcut formula. We're going to rewrite the denominator one minus u we're gonna rewrite that as negative u plus one. So recall, 
instead of subtracting, you can add a negative. So those two denominators are equivalent. Now in my Calculus 2 course, I kind of hopefully go through this, in your opinion, extensively if you had me for Calc 2, to hammer in some of these integration shortcuts. If you didn't have me for Calc 2, this is a good one to kind of just put in your working tool set. All right, we know that one over X integrates to natural log of X. Well, what if we have something of the form AX plus B? What if our denominator is a linear expression in terms of X? So here A and B are both constants. Now you can actually prove this integration formula relatively easily by doing a U substitution. Choose your U as AX plus B. If you carry this out properly and correctly, you should see where the one over A factor comes from. We're gonna use that formula for the integral above. As long as we identify the right value for A, what is in front of your variable? Negative one. So our denominator does contain a linear expression where A is negative one and B is one. So if you were to properly integrate either by doing a substitution right from the beginning or using this shortcut formula, the correct integral for the answer to one over one minus u and its integral should be negative natural log of negative u plus one. So the correct answer here has that negative out front. All right, let's tie this all together. Make sure you realize why in example three, we started by factoring the negative out. It's in the upper right hand corner of the work here. That was to avoid the complications here with the integral, the integral of one divided by one minus u. So make sure you feel okay with identifying the common mistake here and how to fix that. We're gonna to continue to see that throughout the course. All right, that's it for part two. That completes everything that I wanted to cover for homogeneous equations. The next lecture will proceed with another type of differential equation.